All right, sorry for the interruption. Thank you. All right, thanks, John. Uh, so yeah, we'll go ahead and pull up um, the presentation. I've got some slides and also um, in lieu of having an in-person program with the typical live animals that I like to have, uh, we've got some videos of some fairly interesting things that um, I don't think many people know about frogs, in particular, some of the ones that we have here. So let me just switch my screen. All right. Did that come up? There we go. All right, so everybody should be seeing uh, the title slide here. Looks like it. Okay, great. So far, so good. Um, so that that photo on the front there, I'm sure everybody is familiar with. That's our uh, native uh, Pacific tree frog. But before we get into the specifics of the different frogs here, I'd like to just do a little brief overview about what makes frogs unique evolutionarily and in the community of organisms that we um, that we have that we share this place with. So when you look at the uh, history of tetrapod evolution, um, moving from uh, the different um, fish into uh, early tetrapods and then amphibians and then reptiles, um, frogs, uh, they, I don't know if my cursor is showing up here, but the amphibians are fairly early in that evolutionary tree, um, much earlier even than the reptiles. So one of the key differences, um, one of the key developments, I should say, with the evolution of amphibians in um, respect to tetrapods as a whole is the movement from being totally reliant on water to being independent of water and more terrestrial. So amphibians, as you know, they always return um, to wetlands in the spring, uh, typically to breed. Uh, so they are still tied to water, but you do find them, you know, newts are crossing the roads and you see frogs up in the trees and bushes. So they're still, still tied highly to aquatic environments, but they do represent sort of the first efforts of organisms to leave the water. Um, and if you see this word here connected with the reptilia, the amniota, that's the key difference that takes place evolutionarily from, um, from the early tetrapods that are more amphibian-like that require moisture and a lot of water for breeding and just living to reptiles where the first key is the eggs. So amniotes, so the amniotic egg is that key evolutionary difference. So you see here the typical, um, typical amphibian egg mass, um, you know, they dry out really quick if they're not in water, they don't survive. Um, you can see the little yolk sacs that catch the embryos. And here's a skink with hard shelled reptile eggs. So the first amniotic eggs that don't need to be laid in water. So that's, that's one of the key differences there when we think about where amphibians exist um, on the evolutionary tree. So one of the, we'll go over some of the life stages here just briefly. Um, so I'm sure everybody has seen egg masses from amphibians. We've got a little comparison photo here. Uh, this is a frog egg mass, and this is a salamander egg mass. So you can tell the difference between the two um, by the one on the right, that salamander one, that really thick jelly coat and all the eggs are within that one big blob. The frog eggs are individual eggs just rafted together in a big mass. So if you're looking in a pond uh, this coming spring and you see egg masses, you'll be able to tell sort of what you're looking at just by that gel coat. Um, 
but the eggs um, typically laid in the spring uh, for the species that we have here. It's a little different for the invasive bullfrogs, those are during the summer, um, but they proceed to um, develop in the water. Again, if they stay out of the water too long, they don't survive, um, but they'll develop in those eggs into the larval stages. So here's our typical frog tadpole, which looks much different than a salamander larva. So you can sort of see just, it's a very different morphological structure here. Um, you can see this guy's actually a little bit further along than a early tadpole. He's got a little leg there. Uh, they do uh, lose the gills. Um, they grow legs. Uh, and once they develop lungs, they become obligate air breathers, which means they need to come up to the surface of the water to gasp air um, as they begin the process of metamorphosis. So here, same species, this is our um, Pacific tree frog from earlier, from the title slide. So this is a couple weeks apart. So you might see these guys um, as they start to leave the water in the spring when they resorb the tail. So they actually stop feeding entirely and they absorb that tail and all the stored nutrients um, and energy that's in there to drive the metamorphic process. Um, all, um, all anurin, so that's frogs or toads, uh, all anurin larvae do eventually undergo metamorphosis and leave the water um, when they become adults. Uh, that's actually not necessarily true for salamanders. Uh, salamanders can remain neotenic, which means they retain the larval characteristics uh, for their entire life. Um, that's just an interesting difference between the two. So this could very well be a neotenic um, reproductive adult um, of a salamander, where they retain these external gills. They still have lungs, they still have legs, and they can reproduce. They just never leave the water. Uh, that's just not the case for uh, for the frogs and toads. They they are obligately uh, forced to undergo metamorphosis uh, when they become adults. Which brings us to the adult stage. Um, your sort of typical frog structure. Um, they can have developmental abnormalities. Um, sometimes they are missing an eye. Sometimes they have an extra leg. Um, Typically that can be attributed to um, either just a genetic issue or um, environmental issues based on um, contamination of the environment where they develop. Uh, one of the other interesting things to note um, with amphibians uh, in particular frogs is that they actually can respond um, quite readily to changes in their environment. Um, as they are larvae before they truly begin metamorphosis, they can actually start metamorphosis earlier at a smaller size um, if something happens in the environment that makes it not a good environment anymore, whether that's um, the pond just getting really low in water, that'll speed up their metamorphic process. Uh, also, if um, predators uh, get into the pond and start consuming uh, tadpoles or larvae, uh, they actually will release chemical cues to each other that tells the whole population, hey, something's in here, something's eating us, we got to get out of here, um, which is just very, which is very interesting. So they end up metamorphosing at an earlier time and a smaller size than they would prefer to in order to roll the dice on getting out of the pond, getting into the terrestrial environment and getting away from whatever danger they're currently in. So getting to our uh, native frogs, our first one is gonna be that Pacific tree frog, uh, Sudacris regilla. So if you look at the, the scientific name there, the Latin name, that genus is actually not a true tree frog. So these are actually a chorus frog, um, which is a tree frog relative, a very close relative, um, but they are not in the true tree frog um, lineage. Um, so these guys, I'm sure everybody's relatively familiar with, um, they get quite loud in the spring, uh, which is when they return to the wetlands to 
mate and lay eggs, um, which you can see in this picture up here. These are the pretty small little egg clusters that you see, um, typically attached to vegetation um, in the wetlands, not very far below the water surface, but they are below the surface of the water, um, about one to two inches. Um, they can be confused with the long-toed salamander egg masses, um, but again, the jelly coat difference um, is sort of what you can look at to figure out which one you're looking at. Um, so they're usually found uh, pretty close to the ground or in bushes sort of near wetlands along the edges if they're not actively in the water. Um, the, once the eggs develop and the larvae emerge, uh, the tadpoles generally will complete metamorphosis within three months. Um, that can change again on if the local environment is not optimal. Um, and of course, also the, the sort of schedule here, the mating schedule, breeding schedule is also subject to changes based on local temperature. That's as all reptiles and amphibians go, really the thermo, thermodynamics of their environment dictate how, where they are in their life cycle or life history. Um, so lower elevations on orcas will have breeding congregations earlier in the year because they warm up faster than say higher elevations like in uh, Moran State Park, for example, where they'll be delayed um, potentially up to a month or two months um, up at the summit, um, up at Summit Lake. Uh, so once they do metamorphose and they become these adults, uh, they can actually change their skin color. Um, it's a very similar process to how chameleons work. Uh, it's not based on their mood, it's based on the temperature and their stress level and um, uh, things like that. But you can see they, they can go from green uh, to brown to even sometimes uh, shades of kind of a red. Uh, it's, it's not a fast process, um, but it is uh, very cool um, to see. So that's, that's why you tend to see so many different colors of them. If you just end up poking around a wetland, you'll see lots of green, brown, and everything in between. Uh, and they do have some variation in terms of this line down the belly, down the side here. Uh, it can be spots or lines. So our next native frog that we have is the northern red-legged frog. So Rana aurora. So Rana, that's the genus of true frogs, um, which has been split recently, but uh, this particular species is still within that genus. These are really interesting frogs. Um, they breed in spring like the Pacific tree frog, um, but the breeding period is actually very short where the tree frogs tends to be uh, a couple to a few months long. Uh, these guys actually only are actively breeding for a couple of weeks, uh, which is not the norm for frogs in general. Um, they're also very interesting in that they don't necessarily call out of the water you know, they don't necessarily sit with their head out of the water um, with the males uh, using their vocal sacs. They will actually also call underwater. Uh, we do have a video that we'll see of that um, a little bit later. Um, so you can still hear them when they're calling underwater. It's just a lot more difficult. And if you're trying to conduct uh, population surveys of these guys in the spring, uh, it can be tough because you have to catch them right during those two weeks uh, and you have to be very close to hear them. Uh, so whereas the, um, the tree frog, they metamorphose within about three months typically, uh, the tadpoles from the red-legged frogs will actually typically take two 
to three potentially years uh, to achieve metamorphosis because they're a larger frog. So the tadpole has to get bigger uh, to have enough energy in it to drive that metamorphic process. Uh, and as such, because they need to overwinter, they tend to prefer permanent wetlands, which uh, can lead to some problems when they share those wetlands with invasive species. Um, a lot of the um, ponds that would work for these guys, ponds and lakes that would work, would be suitable for uh, breeding habitat for red-legged frogs are also very good habitat for um, the American bullfrog, which we'll get to later. Uh, so down here at the bottom, um, you can see we've got some photos. The egg masses, uh, because these tend to be larger frogs, about up to uh, the size of the palm of your hand, uh, they're gonna have proportionally bigger egg masses. Uh, they will also be attached to vegetation and below the water. Uh, they won't break the surface tension, which is important for one reason we'll get to when we talk about the bullfrogs. And then you can see the tadpole down there at the bottom. Uh, the, the adult and the tadpole photos here on this slide are sort of abnormally red for what I've seen here in the islands. The ones that we have tend to be more gold colored, um, but the tadpoles are large. Uh, they're speckled sort of all over, pretty uniformly colored. And then the adults typically, um, if you sort of look at the underside of the legs, they'll be bright red, hence red-legged frog. Um, but there are actually some places in the islands where you'll have red-legged frogs that don't have red legs. Uh, there's just some local population differences in the genetics where uh, they seem to have lost that pigmentation, which is fairly unique. Um, and just an interesting thing to note, um, the up near the summit of, uh, up around Summit Lake um, in Moran is one of those places. So if you ever see one up there, you can take a look at the legs. Um, but even down at Mountain Lake, uh, they still have those bright red um, thighs. So it's just very localized uh, differences. But one of the other features that you see is this lateral line down both sides, down from behind the eyes, past the tympanum, that's the eardrum. So all the way down to where the hind leg joins the body. So that is much different than the bullfrog. These guys can be kind of confusing with the bullfrogs if they're not very red, um, but that is one of the key features. The bullfrogs do not have this line, uh, but the red-legged frogs do all the way down the body. So here's our native toad, the Western toad, Anaxorus. So that's a, just the, the main genus of toads. Uh, they have not recently been observed on Orcas um, or any of the islands. Um, they had been um, pretty, pretty well spread, but there haven't been official confirmed sightings of them uh, anytime recently. Uh, so if you see one, let me know. Um, they're also spring breeders, um, but toads lay their eggs differently than frogs do. So you saw those frog egg masses, those big sort of balls of eggs. Toads lay their eggs either in strings or spirals. So this particular species lays eggs in strings, just like that. Um, the larvae are pretty quick to metamorphose, pretty tiny when they do metamorphose. Uh, smaller even than the uh, size of your pinky nail, really. Um, and they look very much different than frogs. Toad tadpoles sort of across the board tend to be these little tiny, tiny jet black tadpoles, uh, which makes distinguishing between species of toad tadpoles very difficult unless you have a magnifying glass or a, a scope of some sort to look at the mouth parts. Uh, Thankfully here, we only have or had the one toad. Um, the adults do dig their own burrows, whereas some amphibians will use um, burrows from say rodents that have been abandoned or things like that. Uh, the adults 
for toads, uh, generally, uh, they do dig their own burrows, which is pretty cool. Some toads do have have some specific things that they've evolved, little spurs on their feet, on their hind legs that act as spades, so they can actually really dig very well. Uh, one of the other things here that makes these guys unique, uh, it's another calling feature. Uh, the males actually do not call during breeding season. They simply uh, don't have that, they've evolutionarily uh, lost that particular feature. Um, that's not totally unique among uh, anurans, frogs and toads. There are some species where the males call, uh, but the females can't hear the call because it's a different frequency than they have the ability to hear anymore. So, you know, you typically think of all frogs and toads, you know, they're calling, they have those big choruses in the spring uh, or summer, depending on where you are. But there are some species, this one included, that they don't actually do that anymore. Uh, they do actually still have uh, one call called a release call that toads tend to do when males accidentally try to amplex other males. It's a very specific call that says, hey, I can't lay eggs. Uh, get off me, guy. Um, and we'll actually, I've got a recording of that that we'll be able to hear. Uh, it's a very odd sounding thing. So now let's move on to our, uh, our non-native uh, species. This is the American bullfrog. Um, they previously were in the same genus as the red-legged frog, um, but they have since been split out into a sister group, um, but they are very closely related. Um, as you can sort of tell just by looking at it, it looks very similar to that red-legged frog. Uh, they are introduced. They were intentionally introduced um, back in the 20s. Um, and then also people have introduced them subsequently. You know, if they do some landscaping, dig a pond out, maybe they move from New York or somewhere on the East Coast and they miss frogs. So they bring bullfrogs in and they don't actually realize that bullfrogs are very invasive and very destructive. Um, they get really big. Uh, if anybody is familiar with bullfrogs, they get bigger, much bigger than any of our native uh, amphibians. And they will eat just about anything they can fit in their mouth. Uh, I have seen them eat other bullfrogs. Um, they're not above cannibalism. They will eat garter snakes. So any of our native snakes, uh, an adult bullfrog would be able to eat. Um, they outcompete native species. Uh, so the, they, they, these guys do require um, about three-ish years uh, to achieve metamorphosis because the tadpoles get so big. So just like the red-legged frog, they require permanent wetlands which puts them in direct competition for the same resources as the red-legged frogs. Um, they'll, they overwinter just like the red-legged frogs, you know, when the ponds freeze, that ice forms, but there's also always just a very thin uh, layer of liquid water still at the bottom of the ponds. And that's where the, the tadpoles will sit, right between the ice and the mud in that just very tiny liquid layer. Um, but that it makes them fairly difficult to get rid of once you've been invaded. Um, we actually, there actually have been some relatively successful efforts in Europe, um, in the Netherlands, uh, where they've been able to, over the course of seven to nine years, reduce the bullfrog populations enough um, that they were no longer viable. But it's a very, because they're such long lived animals, they can live up to 12 years uh, and they'll keep coming back to the same wetland over and over. So it's, it's a very complicated and long process of removing eggs, um, trapping tadpoles, and then removing adults. Um, you now, if you look up in the top corner here, this is a picture of a bullfrog egg mask. So that actually looks 
very different than any of our native amphibians because they're, they're these huge egg masses, which we can have some of those from the red-legged frogs and some of the salamanders that we have. But if you see, if you look carefully at the picture, it's actually breaking the water tension. So it's the only amphibian that's out here where the eggs are not below the surface of the water. They're actually sitting on top of the water in a big raft. Uh, that's, that's the easiest way to identify bullfrog eggs. And if you do see any, I highly recommend scooping them out. Um, we're sort of lucky in that we're, we do live in islands. Um, so theoretically, if they were removed, you know, from um, different specific islands, then they wouldn't make it back unless somebody brought them back. So we actually, there is a potential for remediating um, the invasion, so to speak, um, before they do irreparable damage to, uh, to native species. Um, and that is something that we're working on uh, with different landowners. Um, but as you can see, so here, uh, just for identification um, for the adults, they tend to have this lighter green head, uh, a yellow sort of throat. The males have a really large tympanum that's bigger than the eye. Females, it's smaller, uh, but again, they do not have these lateral lines. The ridge, the lateral ridge ends right here at that eardrum. And of course they get really big. Uh, the one saving grace that we do have is that they're from much warmer, um, areas of the U.S. and they, um, so they require sort of hot weather, um, you know, in the high mid 70s at least uh, at night. Uh, so the breeding uh, schedule here is actually very short because our hot part of the summer is actually very short. So they actually don't call for very long uh, out here. <clears throat> but when they do, they're very obvious. And we'll hear some of the calls from them uh, in just a second here. So I'm going to switch over to there's some other, uh, just other resources. Um, so if anybody is interested in um, getting a copy of this presentation, um, I'd be happy to provide it. There's some good resources here. Um, so we've got a couple of different videos here. And so this first one is the Pacific tree frog. This is a male uh, calling uh, in Western Washington. So hopefully the audio is gonna come through all right for everybody. So you can see there the, the male is using that vocal sac, filling that up with air, and that's how he's creating that noise. Um, one of the fun things to do, at least I think it's a fun thing, I'm not sure how the frogs feel about it, is if you actually, if you take your smartphone and you go out at night and during the spring and you record these guys calling, during the day you can go back and sometimes by just playing that recording, you can actually start a breeding course up. Um, they'll just respond to your, your recording just like it's a frog. Uh, it's a lot like how birds will respond to bird recordings and mobbing calls. It's, uh, it's a fun little trick to show people um, <laughs> if you have visitors in the spring. So this next one that we have, this is a red-legged frog calling in the water. So it's a little hard to spot, but right here, right where the, the shadow of the hand is, you can see this, little sort of silhouette of this frog. So that's a red-legged frog male. And you'll have to, you might have to listen fairly closely because he's calling underwater, um, but you can hear uh, what they sound like. And it's much different than that previous call. 
so that's uh I, hopefully everybody could hear that all right um so they they will sometimes crawl out of the water like that uh that tree frog was in which case it'll be much louder much more obvious um but the just the the adaptation to crawling underwater is an interesting one different species uh have evolved different calling behaviors in response to other species that breed at the same time in that if you have a bunch of different species calling out loud in the air, uh, if you've ever heard a really big breeding chorus of multiple species, it gets kind of hard to tell what's what and who's where and how many of what there is. Uh, so some species will um, actually call underwater in order to not be competing at that same, um, with that same calling um, chorus, you know, the, it'll transmit differently underwater and it won't be as mushed in with any of the other species that might be calling. Uh, and this is one of those. Um, some other species like even tree frogs, they just adapt to call louder and louder and louder. If you've ever heard them in Florida, they are very obnoxious. So this next one is the Western toad. So again, the, the males, they don't have vocal sacs to, to call for mates during the breeding season, but they do have this release call. So this is a male that somebody's picking up, sort of to simulate another male grabbing on. Um, and this is the sound that they make. So that's sort of a typical typical feature of uh, toads. Um, frogs don't really do that. Uh, they'll they'll have sort of surprise calls uh, or sounds they make if you've ever walked sort of around the edge of a pond and you hear a little chirp and a splash. Um, but the the release call is sort of particular to toads, uh, and it's just an interesting thing that they they've retained that call. Um, but not a mating call. So this next one is gonna be the bullfrog. So this is gonna be the breeding call. So much different than uh, any of the other ones. Uh, very obvious, very loud. Uh, typically you can hear them at the golf course or uh, Cascade Lake. Um, some of the other ponds um, around here also have them. We have them here at Judd Cove as of this last year for the first time, unfortunately. Um, but they, yeah, so they, they tend to start calling um, usually July and August is really July into August is really when, when the temperatures hit sort of the right time for them to be um, in the water and uh, mating and breeding. Um, pretty unmistakable. There's another sound that they make beyond just the surprised frog sound and the, and the mating call. Uh, it's actually uh, a little disconcerting. Um, it's, I don't know if anybody's ever heard it before. Most people haven't, um, but it's a scream. So it's actually, they, you know, with all of the vocalizations that we've been seeing there, um, if you've noticed the, the mouth is always closed. They don't have to open the mouth to vocalize. Uh, for some reason, uh, when a bullfrog screams, they do open their mouth, which is an odd little thing that they do. Um, but, We'll uh, we'll play this. <laughs> yeah, a little odd. Uh, not the typical sound people think of when they think of frogs. Um, it's just a strange little thing that they've 
evolved. Uh, one of the current theories is actually that it's designed. So if uh, a predator, say a, a big garter snake or a, a fox or a raccoon or something gets a hold of a bullfrog, uh, they make that noise in order to try to mimic an injured animal to bring something bigger in to attack whatever's attacking it. So a bird or a hawk or something, um, which is, it's an interesting theory and certainly could be the case. It does sound a little bit like a dying rabbit um, or an injured rabbit. Um, one of the other things to note with the bullfrogs is actually that uh, if anybody's heard of uh, chytrid fungus, it's the one of the big um, problems sort of worldwide with amphibian populations and communities, especially in um, South America, but also in North America. It's a it's a parasitic fungus that is pretty deadly and spreads very quickly through populations and has been wiping out um, native populations of amphibians all over uh, the Americas, uh, in particular, uh, South America. Um, but there's actually some species of frogs that can get the fungus and have no symptoms. They can be asymptomatic carriers. Uh, just like some people with COVID, uh, and they can actually, when they invade a new um, location, they can actually bring uh, that deadly fungus with them, um, and it can spread to the native um, native amphibians. Uh, we haven't seen any evidence of that here in the islands as of yet, though, thankfully. So I just have one other short video clip here. Um, so typically, uh, tadpoles, the larval form of frogs and toads, tend to feed on uh, plants um, and plankton, uh, but they can become carnivorous and even cannibalistic um, based on food availability and whether or not there's competing species trying to breed in the same wetland. So we'll see this video here. It'll start off with tadpoles eating some plants here some duckweed. And then if you look right in the middle there, there's an egg mass. And those tadpoles are actually trying to eat the eggs of that other species. And then if you see here, this is cannibalism. This is a dead tadpole on the bottom that's being chewed on by those other ones. So that all, again, goes back to just the food availability and the, sort of the local competitive conditions. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and switch my camera back. And I think, John, we're going to open it up to some questions now. Okay, so I just got, <clears throat> excuse me, and make a little change here in our settings. Um, so let me just say we have a quite a big turnout. So I'm going to Try to call. I'm going to ask you to remain muted until you have a question, until I call on you. Um, I'm going to explain the raised hand feature. Um, let's see, so you'll have an opportunity to um, open your microphone. Uh, but the way I'm going to recognize you is by um, the virtual hand. And to do this, please find the participants field on your screen where everyone is listed. You may have to click the participants icon at the bottom center of your screen if it's not already visible. At the bottom right of this field that you open up is the raised hand button. And you'll simply click on that when you have a question and a small hand icon will appear on your screen um, as well as by your name in the participants list and it will remain uh, raised until you lower it. Um, I'll notice the hands and do my best to call in order, um, which may be impossible with 60 people present. Um, but keep your hand raised until you decide you, your question is answered or you decide it has been answered by somebody already. Um, and then lower it when you're done. And let's see how this works. So we are, okay, open this up, go to security. Okay, I think uh, you're all available to uh, speak when called upon. So um, let's see here. 
Oops. All right, let's see. Go to security. Okay, so um, I'm going to be looking if I got to toggle back and forth if I see any hands up, which I don't see. Um, go ahead and raise your physical hand if you have any questions. Of course, you'll have to turn your camera on in order for me to see that. Um, so far, I'm not seeing any questions. Oh, Elsie. Yeah, go ahead, Elsie. You unmute yourself. There yeah, you go. I did. Um, so, Christian, I was just uh, wondering, we have this phenomena every um, beginning of the summer, uh, usually around June. We, uh, as soon as we open our uh, grill on the deck, we start finding at least one uh, Pacific tree frog in there. And uh, then they stay there all summer. We have to take them out before we want to use it and cook and um, put them back. And we have a very small pond area, uh, put them back around there. And then the next time we go to use it, they're back there again. And I'm just wondering what the attraction is. Uh, yeah, actually, that's a, that's a very, um, that's a great observation. Uh, yeah, that is actually one of the behavioral things that you notice with that species. Um, they will tend to find uh, sort of shady, cooler spots um, as things sort of warm up. Um, and also spots where they, you know, they won't be in direct sunlight, um, <sighs> where, where, where they'll lose moisture um, quickly. So they'll, they'll actually seek shady, cool spots like that. Uh, every once in a while, um, I find some in some of my field equipment because they crawl up in there and decide that that's out of the sun. So that's where they're going to be. Um, uh, typically, I usually see them in a lot of places in downspouts, sort of where downspouts come down. Um, and if there's a little catchment at the bottom, uh, they tend to like those as well. And um, hot tub covers. Also. <laughs> Okay. All right. Well, I'm learning something about Zoom here. Apparently, the people that raise their hands with the feature uh, get queued up. So I'm going to call on uh, owner. We've got a user by the name of owner joining us. If you'd like to go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, this is Mary Johansson. Um, my question is, the species that you talked about not being observed in the islands for quite some time, do, we, do you understand why it's sort of disappeared and what the story is there? Um, unfortunately, we don't actually fully understand um, why that is because there's just a big gap um, in hard data on both reptiles and amphibians out here. Because um, there's been a few people over the years that have Sort of poked around um, about that and some local folks who are herpetologists by uh, just sort of passion um, but there, there wasn't any population work done. Um, it certainly could be that just development sort of they could have been just localized such um, in such a way that development of different properties eliminated just a couple of places they were um, or that they relied on for breeding. Um, I see that sort of as a phenomenon with uh, the Northwestern salamander where they're actually on a number of the different islands more than people had thought, um, but they do seem to be very localized to very specific wetlands. Um, and therefore any disturbance there would lead to a, a significant effect on the population. Um, you know, theoretically, the bullfrog invasion, um, as they took over wetlands, could have outcompeted the the toads, especially, um, especially the the larvae. Um, I mean, yeah, the, those bullfrogs are pretty pernicious. They'll they'll even eat baby turtles. Um, so it could be any number of those things. But we just nobody was out here doing um, preliminary work before the before they seemingly disappeared. All right, thank you. We have Holly B on Lopez. Thanks for joining us from Lopez. 
Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I would like to say that on Lopez, I have seen Western toads. Oh. And yeah, so I don't know how large our population is, but I've certainly seen them over the years on my parents' property, which is on Channel Road on the western side of Lopez Island. Oh, and sure. I would just like to say thank you so much for this presentation. I loved it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, my pleasure. Yeah, that's um, the, the person that we have um, that I'm sure you know, uh, Madrona Murphy. Um, yeah, is, love Madrona. Yeah, she, she's got it. She's our resident expert on the uh, sightings of western toads just by virtue of living on Lopez and seeing them um, when she was younger uh, but I can't remember exactly when the last time she said she saw one but it wasn't I think it was at least eight years ago I want to oh, say no. I, I saw one just three years ago oh wow okay well that is fantastic definitely um so I should let Madrona know. Yeah, yeah, de definitely let, let Madrona know if, so she can keep her eyes out and get some okay. photos because that would be, that would be fantastic. Yeah, to know I did, I, I, it never occurred to me that they, that um, they, that they were such a rare sighting that I should have let her know, you know, the last time I saw one. Yeah, yeah, no, they, yeah, they, they used to be more ubiquitous uh, through the islands, but but yeah, yeah, that's that's really, I, really great. I have do. noticed a big increase in our bullfrog population, unfortunately. Uh, yeah. 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 Okay, we've got a uh, Barbie Paulson is waiting <laughs> with a question. Go ahead, Barbie. You're on mute. Go ahead and cl click your icon there to unmute yourself. There I'm you go. I'm wondering what individuals can do to help or mitigate the the species loss and help support the locals in terms of, is it helpful to do a pond in one's own yard or does it need to be of a certain size? Or is that not helpful and we should be supporting the, the natural wetlands? And what's in a wetland that the frogs like? Uh, yeah, so that's a, that's a very good question. So um, it's actually sort of a combination of all of the above really, um, which is not a very specific answer, but there are specific things um, considerations that, you know, you can think of. So as far as the, the natural wetlands go, um, sort of historically, you know, years ago, many of what are now, what became permanent farm ponds were sort of ephemeral wetlands, um, which is where many of our native amphibians would breed. And those have now been converted, you know, over the years to permanent either landscaping features or uh, farm ponds, things like that, which hold water year round and provide sort of corridors for bullfrogs to expand throughout the islands. So that, that's one of the key things that's happened to sort of give them the ability to move around and spread as much as they have. Um, you know, where, where they are sort of already established, you know, those sort of that three-pronged multi-year removal strategy is sort of the, the way to go about that with egg mass removal, larval um, removal with minnow traps, and then um, lethal removal of adults. Um, and that last part, you at least end up with some tasty frog legs potentially. <laughs> um, but all, all three of those, you know, that's one of the reasons why I was getting specific with different identification differences because it can be a little bit tricky if you haven't done it before to make sure you're removing invasives um, and not uh, not native things. Um, as far as adding new wetlands, um, yeah, that's definitely, that could add, very much provide um, good habitat. Um, things sort of tend to, you know, establish themselves really um, when you do that um, you know the first you'll get the aquatic plants and then the insects will move in and then you'll have amphibians potentially if they're if, you know if you've got proximity to existing breeding habitat mm. um, 
the, the pond that's right, so, right outside of my office right here is a man-made pond that has uh, tree frogs, uh, the Pacific tree frogs and long-toed salamanders breeding in there. Um, and over the course of 30 years, um, an entire ecosystem is just established and it is uh, in ephemeral pond. So it does run dry in August. Okay, we're running up against the top of the hour, so I'm just going to make an announcement uh, before uh, I invite Pam to ask her question, or Beth and Pam. Um, and uh, I'll, of course, leave the um, meeting open if, if Christian wants to remain and answer more questions. Um, but let's see here. Uh, I want to thank Christian for joining us, um, uh, coming back to see us again this year. Uh, I want to thank all of our participants. We're off the charts with this. We have had two meetings two presentations prior to this, and we had about three and six for each of those, and this is amazing. So I really thank you all for coming to join us here uh, at Orca Senior Center via our Zoom presentation. Um, and uh, look for this recording to appear the, on the website in the not too distant future. And I invite you, if you like this type of programming, to go ahead and uh, make a donation to Orca Senior Center. Uh, and you can do that by going to orcasseniors.org and there's donate buttons on there uh, to go ahead and uh, that way as well. Um, and then uh, a month from now, we're gonna have another presentation of Meeting the Minds and that's going to take place on Wednesday, December 16th uh, at one o'clock again until two. And that's gonna be uh, Ski Townley, Townley with the Bureau of Land Management. And he's going to present the Bureau of Land Management and the San Juan Islands National Monument, past, present, and future. So uh, hope to see you all next month and tell your friends. And I'm gonna turn it back to Christian now to take more questions if you'd like. And with that, I invite Beth and Pam to ask their questions. If she unmutes herself, click on the microphone icon in the lower left corner of your screen. Pam? Doesn't seem to be working. Let me see, maybe I can unmute her. Okay, I have the power to unmute. Beth and Pam, if you'd like to ask, go ahead. I think she's just teasing us. <laughs> Does anybody else have a question? Just go ahead and blurt it out at this point. Well, it seems like we have no takers. Last call for questions. All right. Well, Christian, thank you so much. You've blown the, the top off of this. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, John, for, uh, for having me. This is, this is great. And I'm so proud. Yeah, this is wonderful. Thank you. You did a, a great job on the Zoom. It's like you've been doing this like a seasoned pro. So. <laughs> I got, uh, uh, yeah. All right. All right. So that's it. And, and thanks to everybody for, uh, for tuning in. And being yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.